Hello, and welcome back to the Product Launch Podcast. As always, I'm the host, Sean Boyce, founder and CEO of Next Step. I'd like to welcome my guest to the show today, Lisa Peskin. Lisa is the founder and CEO of Business Development University, otherwise known as BDU. Hello, Lisa. How are you? And thanks for being on the show. Well, I'm doing great. And thank you so much for having me today. Yeah, I'm very excited to talk about our topic. But before we kind of dive into that, if you could give for our listeners a little bit more information about your background and how you came to be doing the work that you're doing today. Well, you know, it's quite ironic that we're talking about it um, because my dad actually was a big influencer in my life and he actually passed away 24 years ago today, but he gave me three pieces of advice as a little girl. Follow your passion, don't count on your husband for your money, and if you can, someday be your own boss. But I took that advice, I don't know what you would have done, but I took that advice and figured I should be a doctor because I liked helping people. And I went through all the pre-med classes only to realize I was really squeamish and probably would have made a God awful doctor. Knew I liked helping people, finished with a psychology degree. Well, you really need to go on for your PhD. So I went back to Temple for my MBA and I finished with a marketing degree. And back then I was really, really shy and speaking in front of a group or even doing something like this would have really set me into a tizzy. But my dad always said, if you're afraid of something, put yourself in a position to overcome that fear. So I ran for the president of the MBA Association. They had 12 members. By the time I had 150, and it was a precursor to what I'd do later in life. And after 12 years at ADP, working myself from sales to sales management to running a 40-person sales force, I realized that my passion and my forte was helping people to be as successful as possible. So... I knew I always was going to start my own company. And in 2003, I started Peskin Associates, which quite honestly was a lie because there was only one of me. And I knew that I was going to follow my passion, helping individuals and groups of individuals be successful in sales. And I knew I was doing exactly what I should be doing in 2005 when I flew over to China to do some training. And I met a guy from Procter & Gamble on my flight over and he said, if you could do anything in this world, what would you want to do? I had a 14 hour flight, a lot of time to come up with my answer. I landed and I said, I'm doing exactly what I want to be doing. And if you could find a true passion and run and make a business around it, there's nothing better. Love the inspiration. Always love the energy. Obviously, we've known each other for years. I heard a quote recently, which you're really making me think a lot about now, given your story. But they said, figure out what your passion is and find someone to pay you to do it. It sounds similarly related to kind of the inspiration behind the work that you've ultimately been doing recently. I just got a fortune cookie and it said, you know, passion is the key to success, right? You know, once you find that passion and really, then you don't have to worry about selling anything. It's just about helping people, you know? And for those of your listeners that, you know, have a SaaS product, it's all about, they designed it to help a company accomplish something. And so now we don't have to think about of ourselves as selling them anything. Let's just find, try to find more companies to help out with our product. Such a great point. And I think it's one that often goes overlooked. People fall into different categories when you start talking about passion and the work that you do. I've learned this lesson the hard way as well too, where I've started building SaaS companies, B2B SaaS companies around something that I thought was a good idea at the time and I was interested in, but it wasn't a passion of mine. And then when you have those long days and you know things aren't going well, at least yet, or things aren't going right, it's much more difficult to keep going if it's something that you're not passionate about. So I'm glad that you mentioned that. And especially when it comes to talking, you know, business development and things like that as well too. If you're not passionate and genuine about the message that you're delivering, it's going to be relatively obvious to the people you're speaking with. I'm sure you have a perspective on that. Well, I just think it it has to be authentic. And so I do really believe that if you run your business as I'm just trying to find more businesses that I could help out. And if you don't think you're a good fit for a particular company, let them know. Always put your head on the pillow at the end of every day. That's what 
is kind of exciting about all this. And for those of you who are listening, you know, it wasn't an easy step to decide to start your own business in the first place. But to me, half of their success, for those of them that are gonna to get to be successful, half of it is this one and this one. It's attitude and motivation, right? I could teach somebody how to sell. But unless you have the right mindset and are motivated to do what you need to do, understanding that the first couple of years are gonna be a little tough. I remember taking people out to lunch, thinking, how am I gonna pay for this lunch? Like, you know, that's what happens when we start our own business and you kind of fake it till you make it a little bit. It's a powerful motivator, I will say that. And I've been there plenty myself. <laughs> so I know it's an effective one too. Um, awesome. Well. That's obviously what we want to talk about with you because that's where you have a tremendous amount of experience, business development, sales. It's a very important aspect of growing and building a successful SaaS business. And it's one that I think a lot of people that get involved in doing it may or may not have that as part of their background, right? Some people come to it from a business experience, but not other people take more of a technical approach. So long story short, all of us can improve. So that's what we want to talk to you about in terms of what can we do to prospect, to generate leads, to qualify leads better, right? basically looking for you to walk us through a little bit more in the methodology in terms of how should we be thinking about building and growing our SaaS businesses when it comes to business development and sales. Okay. So I'm going to try to make it as easy as possible so that people can actually take these ideas and run with it. So if we're going to look at success in sales for anyone, for an individual or a company, we're going to look at three different aspects. The first one is that filling up the pipeline. So that's getting our first couple customers, holding on to them, maybe finding new ways we can help them upsell and cross sell, and then getting enough, enough net new ones coming in the door. So that's number one, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Number two is process. So now we've got a suspect or prospect, client, or center of influence in front of us. What's the process that we take them through? How do we run an effective meeting? How do we uncover key information? How do we present our ideas and solutions? How do we handle objections? How do we ultimately close the business? So that's number two. And then the, num the number three is what I just talked to you about is this one and this one, right? So I'm gonna dive into each one a little bit more. So prospecting. That seems to be one of the biggest bugaboos with a lot of folks. They've got a great idea, they've got a great product, but how do I go about and find the ones that are good for me? Well, you gotta work your numbers. So I'm gonna say for everyone, the first thing that you should be writing on your piece of paper right now is a 30, 60, 90 day game plan that's part of your annual game plan. And so we got to make sure that you've got your 30, 60, 90 day game plan and the way you might look at this, if I sent you away for three months on an all expense paid vacation and you put somebody else in your position with your same smarts, your same background, in fact, everything that you've got, but they can't think for themselves, what would you have them do? And you got to reverse engineer the numbers. So the fact of the matter is, if you say you want X amount of revenue for the year, then we've got to work it backwards. So we're going to subtract out your repeat business. And with the SaaS, the great thing is, is you're going to have that annual recurring revenue, right? We're going to subtract that out. Then we're going to look at what we could upsell and cross sell. And then we come up with whatever that net new number is. Then we're going to figure out how many grand slams, home runs, triples, doubles, and singles we're going to get depending upon the size. We're going to find out then how many sales do we want to make? And then we apply our close ratio, which is defined as proposals to sales. And then we know how many proposals and not every appointment turns into a proposal. So then we got to work our way backwards to number of net new appointments, which again, put a star on your piece of paper because that's one of your most important numbers. And then it's, how am I going to go about getting those net new appointments? 
And back in the day when I started in sales, we could either call them, send them a letter, or stop by. Now we got to go at it from so many different directions. We've got LinkedIn, you know, there's so many different things right now. So we need to take a multi-pronged approach and you need to have a methodology to go after the larger accounts. So once you develop your list, then I'm going to highly suggest that everybody puts together a 10 touch program with a particular cadence so that you can get to your key decision makers. Because the fact of the matter is it takes eight to 12 touches to get into somebody and too many people are stopping at a lot less than that and a lot of people aren't even doing the prospecting that they need the second piece of that before i i stop for a moment is the networking he, you want to develop a network of individuals that are going to refer you business so we were working with one of our clients last week that's a SaaS company right they sell to hospitals not easy to get into hospitals. So we did a search on LinkedIn and we put in consultants that work in the hospital space with one to I think 50 employees in two certain areas. We came up with great referral sources because building those relationships is such a great way to fill the funnel. There's so much value there. I don't know where to begin but I'm going to try. <laughs> There's a lot of awesome stuff I want to talk to you about further, and I'm going to kind of break it down a little bit. So thank you for that content. The first where I want to start, and I kind of want to go from there, is you mentioned a few times this concept of like prospecting and ultimately like qualifying a prospect or having an initial conversation. Can you talk to us a little bit more detail there, what you would recommend for people in terms of how do they have an initial conversation? I think there's confusion sometimes from founders and people building SaaS businesses in terms of how do I talk about my product, right? Um, I have some ideas, but I want to hear from you, obviously. So now we're talking about the middle one, right? Which is the process, which is thank you for that good transition. So now we've got a suspect or prospect in front of us. And by the way, there is a bunch of tools up on my website. I know we'll get to it later, but this is one particular tool called a prospect visit checklist. And it's got everything that I'm about to tell you, all right? It's free, you could download it. So just put that as a note on your piece of paper. So every meeting needs the following steps. So the first four steps are pre-call planning, right? So before you go and have a meeting, you got to be checking them out on LinkedIn, see common connections, find out something about them that you wouldn't normally know. And you're going to use that to start with your rapport building, which is your second step. Make sure when you ever have an appointment, and, and you're going to be doing a lot of virtual appointments as well, that you start with something like if, if someone went to an Ivy League school, I might say, hey, Sean, it looks like you're a real underachiever. Something that, you know, or, you know, I remember the editor of the Philadelphia Business Journal, it said ice hockey as, uh, as something under his hobbies. So I walk in, I'm like, ice hockey, huh? Because I'm a hockey mom, or I was a hockey mom, terrible one, but I was. So that's the second step. We do our pre-call planning, then we start with building rapport. Then we transition to confirmation of time. We could be talking about X, Y, Z all day long, but I know your time is really valuable. I know what I'm hoping to get out of today's conversation, but this is all about you. So when we hang up in an hour and you say that was a perfect use of our time, what are you hoping to accomplish? That was something asking their agenda before you state your agenda is really critical. And some people don't even set agendas. They get right in and then they lose control of the conversation. So that was step number three. After that, you got to position yourself and set your own agenda. So what I'm hoping to do, I want to find out as much as I can about you and your business because ultimately I want to see whether I'm able to help you out. And I'm going to tell you right from the start, if I don't think this is going to make sense for you, I'm going to be the first one to let you know, because the last thing I want to do is waste any of your time. And if at any point in time today or in the future, you don't think that this is a good fit, you'll let me know. Does that sound okay to you? Okay. So we say that, and then I'm going to say two more things, and then I'm going to be quiet for a moment. So the next thing is there's two kinds of needs. There's what your prospect needs and how you're able to help them with their software, right? But what do you need to know? And it's my belief that we got to figure out what we need to know first. 
So before we get into everything, just so I know, other than yourself, is anybody else going to be involved in this if you do decide to take advantage? And if we're sitting here a year from now, we're high-fiving each other, what would success look like for you? And just so I know, are you looking at any other alternatives? And what criteria are you going to be using to make your decision? When are you hoping to get this implemented? What would be your timeline? What's your process? Is this a must-have or like-to-have? Do we uncover ROI? And do we know budget? I'm going to suggest we ask those questions before we get into the needs analysis. I love how you've broken it out into a framework in terms of how to think about it. I think this step in the process overwhelms some when they're thinking about how to do it. I know a lot of people make a lot of mistakes. I know you've seen that, and I know you've also helped correct that. Um, in particular, as part of what I've learned, right, for the most part, doing it the wrong way <laughs> and having to learn it the hard way because I didn't have access to an expert like you, glad that I do now, is to really set uh, the agenda for that type of a conversation and then to focus it on them more than you. I think a lot of people start with, you know, here's what we do kind of thing. It really should be about more like, what do you need? Like you're saying, and the, the irony is that with user research, a lot of us who are building these SaaS companies, we, we follow that pattern when we're doing the homework, when we're trying to figure out what to build and what to create our companies into. But then when we sell it, we, we forget those principles for whatever reason. It needs to be consistent from one to the next. The same reason we do that from a research perspective is to find the problems that we can solve with our product. And then when we're communicating the value proposition of our product, it should be operating still in a similar fashion, right? We're, we're talking with someone else. We may have a product at that point, but we still need to know they have a problem. And then like you said, we need to know whether or not we can help them with that problem. Uh, and there's value there for two purposes, right? If we, at the point or wherever a product is, we can help them in that moment, that's potentially an opportunity to make our product better if that becomes more of a pattern. So that's helpful data, among the other things you, you mentioned in terms of great questions to ask. If we can help them, now we know we can speak, but more specifically about their concerns and how our product can address them. And it really helps the conversation move forward naturally, as opposed to them feeling like you were forcing them into some form of a conversation they don't really want to be a part of. Couldn't agree with you more. And um, I used to say that salespeople or even people that have developed a software, they want to go to an appointment and I hope you don't mind me using this expression, but they show up and want to throw up, right? They want to just, but recently I heard an even better one. They have the itch to pitch. So they want to get right to, let me, let me show you a demo of my, of my software, right? And it's a critical mistake. I mean, just imagine if you walked into a doctor's office, they didn't take that information on the clipboard. They never took your vital signs. They never asked you all the questions and they walk in, they go, you need some open heart surgery. Then <laughs> you would call that malpractice, right? But they go through a very methodical process. And I've realized over the years that if we miss one little thing, it could be one little thing that could be the difference between getting the opportunity and not getting the opportunity. And so let me give you just a little example. There's a company that was in Bluebell, Pennsylvania that got bought out by IBM. And I worked with them probably, I'm going to say eight years ago. It was a SaaS play. And the, what happened was they had an internal team setting up the demos and the salespeople got on and they started demoing without asking any key information. And they weren't able to quantify the solution. So what the company did was protect laptops and devices that got stolen or whatever and protect the integrity of all the information. And I, I'll never forget this. We came up with a, an example in England of a situation where a laptop was stolen from an attorney. They got a $1.2 million lawsuit. We used that, what I call FUD, in this particular instance, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. But we used that and quantified it during the sales process. And once we changed those two little steps, it was a game changer. And the acronyms and the analogies are also helpful to remember as well, too. So <laughs> I'm going to be keeping track of them also. And thank you for the examples. So um, I think that's really helpful from the perspective of giving us more context around how do we build an effective prospecting process? And then how do we just start to have an effective conversation, right? So what I'd love to hear 
you talk a little bit more about now is how do we put everything together, right? How do we tell an effective sales story as I like to refer to it as such? And we do a lot of those, we do a lot of that work when we're doing this user research and we're figuring out what a user's experience has been like with our products in terms of product positioning. But right, a lot of that has implications for what our sales and business development teams or professionals on our team do and say about our products when they're speaking with someone new or they're speaking with someone who's going to be, you know, purchasing more or whatever it's going to be. So please lay out for us as well too, how we connect everything together to tell an effective, right, quote, sales story. Okay, so there's so many pieces of this, but let's go back to our analogy of the doctor's office, right? So the first appointment, I'm gathering as much information. I might need to get to a bunch of different key players to gather all the information, right? But not until I have all the information, so I figure it out how I'm gonna be able to help them out. And then when I go into presentation mode, which oftentimes shouldn't be during the discovery call. It should be another appointment where you make sure you're presenting to everybody because you miss one key person. That could be the difference between getting the business and not getting the business. So you want to make sure that you determine who the decision makers are. And then oftentimes during your discovery call, set up your next appointment. And one key thing I learned over the years, no loosey goosey next steps. Always set to find next steps because otherwise they go radio silent and you can't get them back on the calendar. The next thing is when we are presenting, think about your history present professors or teachers along the way. I was terrible at history. They made me remember the battles, the dates, the wars. I could never put it all together, but you show me the movie and I can get it all down. So we need to have stories. We need to have anecdotes. So I'm working with this one company now that, you know, is in the SaaS space. And again, they work with the hospitals. They are able to save hospitals millions and millions of dollars by doing one thing internally. And so you've got to have these stories and the salespeople need to be able to articulate these stories in a compelling manner that clearly articulates the value proposition as well as the quantifiable difference. Because once you quantify the results, then you put your solution, your software in the, in the context of what they want to achieve. That's when you're going to start selling a whole bunch of software. Super helpful. Thank you, Lisa. That connects a lot of those pieces together. Really important for completing the story, if you will. Um, and thank you for being here, obviously. Share all this valuable information with myself and our audience. We only have a couple questions for you before we let you go. Um, the first one is, what resources would you share with the audience where they can go to learn more about any of the information you've talked about here today? You mentioned a few resources that you have. We'd love to link to those as well also. So please, if you will, share any of those with us also. Sure. So when I went into business, one of my mentors says, go into business not to make money. Go into business to help as many people as possible. So on the website, businessdevelopmentuniversity.com, easy to spell, just a little bit long, you're going to see something, resources, then be the utensils. So all these tools that I've developed over the past 34 years, they're all there and so many are in a Word version that you could just take it. So there's a client visit checklist, there's a networking visit checklist, there's a prospect visit checklist. So... There's a whole bunch of tools there that could help you out. There's a game plan, so that's one of them. The second thing is we just launched our book club. And this was the first book that we did, Fanatical Prospecting. If you don't know Jeb, he's fantastic. Another great guy, Sales Gravy. And so we have it the third Thursday of every month from 5.30 to 6.30 Eastern Standard Time. And if you want a little bit of a bookmark, you know, just get to me and I'll make sure I get those to you. We also, every single Friday, we have a sales success peer group. It's totally free. It's from 12 to 1 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And I started it when COVID happened just to help people out. And now it's morphed into such an amazing group of people. And I'm pulling in these amazing guests each and every Friday. And then the other thing is 
We do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching and help people with using LinkedIn for their business development efforts. So if you ever want to talk, get in touch with me. My cell phone and contact information will be given out to you. Don't hesitate. Text me, call me, email me. And if I can help you in any way, it would be my pure pleasure. And thank you so much, Sean, for this opportunity. Obviously, I'm a sales nerd. I love talking about this. And we didn't really talk about objection handling and closing. So maybe we'll talk about that in the future. Because once you present your ideas, then you got to deal with the last two stages as well. Absolutely. And next episode is a great idea. But before I let you go, I know you mentioned a few of these, but I want to make sure we get that in here. And this will all be in the show notes as well, too. But um, who should reach out to you and how can they get in touch? So the people that we love to help out are anybody that own businesses where they're either responsible for the sales and business development or they've got salespeople that are responsible for sales and business development. The fact of the matter is that's the hardest position to hire for. So if you don't have a sales leader or somebody that's doing everything they need to to maximize the performance and the potential of your direct reports, then you're going to experience turnover. So anybody that's got a business that wants to figure out how to get a whole bunch more clients in 2021, those would be the great ones for us. And not to be too corny, but I've just got to end it with this. So 2021, a year to get things done, have some fun, be number one, get improve business one and improve a ton. Awesome. Love it. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thanks for being here and sharing your awesome knowledge with myself and our audience. Oh my gosh, my pleasure. Uh, I very much enjoyed it and hope I gave you guys some ideas that you could take right away to help you for 2021 as well. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Product Launch Podcast powered by Next Step. If you or anyone you know is involved in scaling a B2B SaaS business, please have them reach out to me about becoming a potential guest on our show. They can email me at sean at nextstep.io. That's S-E-A-N at N-X-T-S-T-E-P dot I-O. At this time, we'd like to take a moment to thank the sponsor of our show, Next Step Consulting. Would you like to know what the right next steps are for your B2B SaaS business? Are you trying to grow and scale, but you're stuck? We can help. To find out how Next Step can help your B2B SaaS business achieve its goals, please email me, sean at nextstep.io. That's S-E-A-N at N-X-T-S-T-E-P dot I-O. Thanks and keep disrupting.